Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our second Center for American Architecture Design Forum event for the semester. Today, I'm happy to welcome Mike McCall. Mike is one of our adjunct faculty members. Before this, though, he taught at Berkeley and the California uh, College of the Arts in San Francisco. More to the point for today's talk, though, in 1989, he founded the McCall Design Group. The group, first based in San Francisco, um, had an intent to work with communities, to work with communities to understand their context, be that social, economic, technological, to develop ways to shape our environment that became meaningful. This work included working with Google Industries, the McCall Summer Intern Studio, which won recognition by AIA San Francisco, um, and has continued its work to try to make the world better day by day. And I'm gonna mention, emphasize that day by day part. His, his talk today is, is about quotidian practice. Now, it might be easy to say quotidian, that's the ordinary, the everyday. Yeah, that's it. And that's kind of the point. If you wanna make an impact in someone's life, you might do it with a big giant event, but more meaningful things happen bit by bit, incrementally over duration. That thickness of time and of experience begins to matter as we move forward in our lives, as we move forward with our families, with our communities. With that, I'm very, very delighted to welcome Mike to this talk. Thank you, thank you, Alan. So, First, I want to make sure I know how to do the slides. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. It's, uh, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. To, uh, it's an honor to be at this forum. It's not necessarily one I'm sure I deserve, but uh, since I'm here, I will do my best. McCall Design Group, which button do I push to? Uh, McCall Design Group was founded in San Francisco on August 1st, 1989. It was just in time. The Loma Prieta earthquake. McCall was founded with one goal in mind, and that was the collaborative practice of architecture. McCall, such a practice we believe must embrace design, engage the community, enhance the environment, and evolve with technology. We use this simple, very simple model of four constraints to guide everything we did. That's the problem, the place, the time, and the people involved. Within that, we developed a series of contexts for everyday practice. So when it comes to solving the problems of the program, those are given, you must do that. That's not negotiable. But then there's an idea of trying to create a greater utility, sort of a utilitarianism making the place better, making it, uh, the community better for everybody. And, and that's one of our goals. We always seek ways to do that. When it comes to the site, there's always the appropriation of the site. Lots of our clients were people involved in the global globalization and gentrification. So we looked at ways to take that appropriation and reappropriate and find elements and, and ideally make the whole project part of the community and not just part of the client's uh, uh, late capitalist attempts at profit making. So in terms of time, there's a bunch of things you can talk about time and all of these things can be interacted, uh, interacted and interrelated. But this, the schedule, for example, was never negotiable. In, in the 30 years we practiced, we maybe caused a delay of a day or two less than five times. We never miss deadlines, but that's not what I mean by time. I'm talking about the era we, pre we practiced in. And for us, that was the era of postmodernism. Uh, so there's two types of postmodernism. I think there's the reaction, the type which we see really proliferating now with attempts to maybe make America great again, et cetera. It's the neoconservative reaction to the, to the modernist project. But there's another type, and that's the postmodernism of resistance. And that's where we would resist the idea that the opposition of modernism had been co-opted and now was the establishment, but we would also resist the postmodernism of reaction. People, one of the things that I want to talk about with everyday practice is that our clients are all strategic thinkers. They think big plans, big plans. We were tactical thinkers. We thought, oh, 
what's our opportunity to do something meaningful and to enhance the, uh, the place in the project that we were working on. How come I can't make it work? What am I doing wrong here, guys, quickly? Okay, I'll do that then. Okay, much better. So if you take a couple of these and just plot them on a graph, uh, resistance to reaction strategy to tactic, we saw McCall always in trying to be in this upper right-hand corner. Uh, not that strategic thinking is necessarily evil, but perhaps because we were terrible at it. Uh, the three main practice areas we, we dealt with were for profit, and that's how the firm ran, uh, pro bono, and then our summer studio. We couldn't mix the idea of academics in this because we did a lot of work with Cal, Stanford, and, and CCA, and, and Texas the whole time, a good portion of the time. For example, I was on the uh, Dean's Advisory Council here. But all of this is meaningless if we don't have what we consider to be the, the, uh, the conceptual framework for a project. We always would start with uh, looking through those constraints, problem, place, time, people. We would start research, investigation, selection, iterative process, and we would always try to either have a series of small ideas that coalesced or a big idea. This project was basically a marketing device for the Long Beach State Museum proposal. Uh, these were, we considered to be advertisements for The concept of mediating will mediate its relation to the city, the Long Beach climate, and the building's interior environment, the speed of the automobile, the cruise, and that of the pedestrian, the stroll, the relationship of art to architecture, and the meaning of art to the community. We propose a project that defies the boundaries of the walls of the museum, one that questions the position of art to society. A museum that places art not only within and without its walls, but also projects art, both literally and figuratively, into the community. We wish to redefine the Museum of Contemporary Art. Those types of conceptual statements were, are essential to the success of any project. Again, these were considered really just, uh, it was a charrette, a uh, series of images that they used for marketing. And uh, it, it turned out to be that they didn't do it, but they ended up doing something on campus instead of downtown. As we were doing this, we also codified sort of an idea that's really important to everything we do. And I think it's important to everyday practice. It comes out of the idea of the walk or walking as everyday practice or the derive of the situationists. Uh, and so, we, we sort of play. Each participant creates their own dance with the random cast of their chance encounter. One last thing that we, we developed in this project or we codified was our idea written for a museum that a contemporary museum is not simply a building to exhibit painting and sculpture. It is a framework for participating in the evolving arts of our time and the future. It is one of the many places where we sculpt our destiny. So this idea, these ideas, movement, dance, chance encounter, and participation, and architecture as the frame for the community is something we always strove to do in, in any project we're doing, whether it's for money, for free, or in the studio. Uh, this is a, an example of another conceptual piece because it was an ideas competition we could, uh, SOM was one of the uh, people in this, pro, in this competition. For Charles Schwab, uh, we were trying to look, conceive of the brokerage, retail brokerage office as beyond office, beyond retail. And we wanted to make it about like hospitality, where everyone felt greeted and special and that they were on a type of investigation into their financial future. We also wanted to embed technology into all of the, uh, the spaces so that you could actually project your net worth on the wall if you wanted. And this is the exact opposite when a long-term client, William Sonoma Inc. came to us and said they were thinking of doing Pottery Barn Teen. We, we got all the youngest people in the office together and said, what do you want to do? And they said they wanted to do something analog and they wanted to do something 
that led to scrapbooking because at that point that was very popular. And so we made a really big, thick uh, scrapbook. Here are a couple of them. You can see the little two hole punches. And we then reduced these and, and made a series of handouts that we gave to everybody. And uh, well, regretfully, they hired another firm. Uh, this is an example of how we, we would, this is an inversion. So we would design, we designed this project completely in, in, in uh, completely in, in, in a digital environment. We did very detailed photorealistic drawings. And then we take those and we pretend that someone has come to this building when it's been built and does a beautiful watercolor of it. And that's what we present to the community. So there's a sense of embedded memory in the project itself, even before it's built. And it's a way that you can entice people into the understanding of the project and make it more compatible for lay people in particular and boards. And, and uh, it, it was always very successful for us. Uh, this is the main street. And we, again, from a formal point of view, from a compositional point of view, you can see where it's on a square, trying to work with the blot lines, break it up and create a very vibrant base of retail. So there's a point where all of our projects sort of melt together. And this is one where we were doing uh, two W hotels in Chicago. And uh, so we were doing all the common spaces. And then they went to, to, to do the rooms. Starwood went to do the rooms and they noticed that there was not a single room in this hotel that was the same. And they said, hey, can you guys help us? So we said, yeah, sure. And then we thought we had a robust group of, uh, it was between recessions. So we had a bunch of, we had a really robust group of summer uh, students. I guess you can't use the word intern anymore. And uh, they all flew back to Chicago and spent three weeks, uh, what do you call it? Uh, measuring each room, doing the space plan, et cetera. When they came back, their mentors, this is city center. This used to be what they call a short stay hotel near the board of tra uh, the commodities trade in uh, trade in, in Chicago. And this is uh, from a renovation of a day's in to a W. Uh, and their mentors, the people who had recruited them from Cornell said, hey, we should do something for the next two months, two weeks. I said, great, let's do something. Let's do a studio. Let's do something exciting. And they said, we talked to them. And because we did a lot of retail, they wanted to do the gap of the future, which was kind of blew my mind. And it turned out really, really interesting. There was a lot of really good work in it. Uh, this is the Fort Corsair of the old days in now the W. So we worked with one really historic building, one somewhat uh, plain and ordinary building, both of which became very successful. I want to explain one thing. Pro bono should never be mistaken for community service. Community service is part of, was always part of ours, and, and I think it should be everybody's uh, for-profit day-to-day practice. But our community service was never really driven by the firm. or the, It was driven by the people who worked there. And all you had to do was say, here's something I want to do. Get a team together, and we would support it as long as it was uh, for the better of the community. This is St. Castle, and if you might know something about this, on Ocean Beach every year, architects and designers do the St. Castle competition to, to uh, uh, support school. So we would go to the school and hang out with the kids. The kids would come to the office, we'd show them slides, we'd give them snacks, and then they would do work, break into our teams and develop a, a little project. And it was really exciting every year. We also did parking day. This was one that uh, this team was really into the idea of what if the financial district, which we were near, uh, right at Portsmouth Square, which used to be the coastline, was restored as mud flats. And so we looked at all the plants that could be used there. We we gathered permeable papers, et cetera. And we, we did a, uh, a board showing the primary grasses that grew. We, we gave out seeds to the community. And we gave away all the plants at the end. One year, we also did one where we did gaming balls out of uh, helium balloons. And then the idea was, the theme was, make sure you play at work. And so we did all these things with uh, 
Nerf footballs and hula hoops and board games. And uh, it was really quite, quite engaging and quite fun. Although I can't hula hoop. So another uh, community service thing that I think was is really fun in San Francisco, they have this pet architecture for all the design firms, architectural firms, et cetera, uh, do uh, a house for a pet. And then the, the proceeds all go to PAWS, which stands for Pets Are Wonderful Support. And these people take care of pets of people that are bedridden so that they can have their pets. This is probably what you would call uh, Habitat for Humanity Gothic. Uh, but our primary work was always uh, retail. So this is five easy pieces. Uh, this is New York. It's a renovation of Rockefeller Center, which we were a fairly significant tenant. Uh, we thought about all the, uh, the architectural stuff we were trying to do references to grand shopping spaces, the deco sort of era of, of Rock Center. And uh, but from a, a point of view of the community engagement in our everyday practice, we wanted this to be a place that was very accessible to everybody, that a, a place that centered around this opening, the ley lights with the quays around it, almost like a street scene where you could wander through the shops if you're having a bad day at work and not worry about a thing. And then we tried always to have a high degree of attention to detail. And um, the esteemed critic Reed Karloff once said to one of our clients or one of our uh, employees, when he asked him if he'd been to Rock Center, he said, well, to me, it's just another Banana Republic store. And so I told the guy to tell him, thank you. This is the similar piece two of five easy pieces, San Francisco. Uh, what I really like about this project is that, uh, well, again, we, we're, we're talking about the center stair, the flow from room to room, the idea of some of the grandeur, of breaking it down to human scale, all those things that, to make it a place where you can feel comfortable cutting through the building on your way from one place or another. But when the architect, uh, Philip Johnson, went to San Francisco and he looked at the city of Paris uh, shopping, shopping uh, uh, what do you call that? the big the, uh, store, which had sort of failed. He said, we need to tear it down. These buildings will not be accessible. They won't work for contemporary retail. And the city fell for it. So here you can sit and just gaze. Oops, excuse me. But we didn't. Rather, we worked with the city, the merchants associations. We worked with uh, everybody involved. To, to restore the building, to keep the building, to make that part of the community, to collective memory. And uh, then when we do the storefronts, we reuse the sign to put our function with what's there, but never to mimic it and never to uh, copy it. This is a, a, an interesting collaborative process in um, Chicago, again, it's a banana republic. These are five easy pieces. The idea of the ley light above, the opening of the stair to organize, it's very simple compositional uh, operations. But what was really fun about this was working with the landlord's architect. These are, this is a new building on Michigan Avenue. We worked with Banana to design the storefront, we, or the building facade. We gave it to the landlord's architect. They did the core and shell. And then we came back and did the interiors. This is a similar idea. This is not our building, but it's the landlord's building. It's actually part of a mixed use in Portland, Oregon. The high rise uh, portion was what the architect was really felt they were good at. So they came to Banana and to us as a prime tenant and said, can you help us come up with the criteria for the retail? And one of the main things we did was talk about the openings, the entrances, the way they work together. And then we always like in the rainy country to do glass canopies that will allow a protection, but also light to come through. Uh, this is not around the stairwell, but it's a, also the idea of a rotunda. And then the stair itself, you can, as you proceed up, you can actually see through the show window and into the street. And you can also see through the street into the, to the stair as people ascend or descend. 
But this is our last of five easy pieces. And this is the most obvious example of, uh, you know, we're flirting with preservation. So a building like this, all we would try to do is the infill in a way that showed it was contemporary and of our time, but respected the building and the history of business in Philadelphia on Walnut Street. Uh, perhaps the uh, open-ended retractable awnings are a little corny, but I think they work well. And then on the interior, again, looking for strategies to work within the way that the merchandising all works, but that you can do something a little bit different based on time and place and where you are. Uh, so now we move into green architecture. That, yeah, yeah, this is a lead platinum project. So one of our tactics there was when people would always say, well, we need, how would it change if you did it with lead? So one day, a little bit flippantly and without really knowing what I was said, I told the, our, our, our apps in Sephora's part of that, what if it didn't change at all? And they said, could you do that? And I said, of course. But, and, and we did. And uh, the ability to create uh, an architecture, uh, an architecture. Uh, and, and, and the other way to look at that is that uh, the, the notion of what is sustainable is, is not a style. It, it, it is, it is a, a method of working. We, let me, real good, briefly, we were very engaged in lead for retail. We did two of the pilot programs. We did uh, well over 30 stores for Sephora that were lead certified. We did that also with Nike uh, in their factory stores. Uh, and we, we thought early, even before that, well, we own the specs, so we don't want that smell in our stores. So what we didn't ever do a blue down carpet. We didn't ever do high VOC paints. We didn't do sealants that poison you. We, we did low flow toilets. We did uh, air conditioners with, with, uh, with maximizers. And we took out all the incandescent and did as much early on uh, fluorescent and then later LED. Autodesk is, uh, this is the executive briefing center. This is about two stories more or less. One is the, uh, the notion, uh, uh, it's a lead platinum project as well, but it's also about collaboration. This was an integrated process. We worked with Anderson Anderson, who are architects and friends. We then brought in Charles Salter, for all of the audio visual and the acoustics as a partner. Uh, the fourth uh, prong of that was HOK, who is the global architect for uh, Autodesk and did the other two thirds of this floor. And we all worked together in a very, very productive and collaborative way. I would say that the person who was least collaborative was the uh, Autodesk attorney. And then after that was their project manager. And if the project manager thinks that in an integrated process, their role is to be the hard-nosed guy that keeps everyone in line, it doesn't work as well because the idea is for everyone to work together, collaborative, and take ownership, not to be put into shape by a project manager. Uh, this is a little technical drawing of how the project, we didn't want to embash uh, like screens and stuff like this into the, we wanted the surfaces to be um, material. And then we did the images as projections. So this is a way to uh, get the aspect ratio correct, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can see how it kind of works uh, so that this content can be changed regularly. And one, the one criteria for the uh, exhibitions is that everything here and every time they ever do a new show, it has to be things that were designed with Autodesk tools. But along the process, when you do a thing like this and you start to do demo, and you go, okay, that column's a nice column. That brick wall, the backup wall is a nice wall. We don't need to, to finish it. We can save on the material, not for necessarily the money, but one, so that you expose these wonderful conditions that come out of pure materiality. And, and two, you invest less carbon and less material into the project. Uh, this is, the way I describe this is stealing from Claude Levi Strauss, the anthropologist. It's the raw and the cooked. And it's a, an idea that we, we really did a lot of 
brought with in, in our practice and in this project. So here's a really fun example of how the the very cooked, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, the, uh, on the exterior, the terracotta, then the backup wall left exposed, and then sort of as an architectural, uh, maybe a pop art pun, is this reveal, is a huge reveal, and the, 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 the cooked part and the raw part where they meet, we've left this void, which is also a service place uh, to do the HVAC on the perimeter zones and allows for east maintenance and rebalancing. If you ever wondered how to get a car into a building, here's one way. That's the ferry building in San Francisco. That's the, uh, you know, where, where the Loma create the earthquake destroyed the Embarcadero freeway and it was removed and, and it's created a really wonderful uh, chance encounter uh, with, with uh, what the, the old and the new. And I, I really like this. It's kind of like, um, you know, sometimes when something is missing or something's removed or something's erased, and you will notice what was there before that you didn't notice. And I think this is a really poetic and beautiful part of the city now. So this is an example. We had a new client we were developing and uh, they called the next day and said, I know you were just here, but we got a project in Reno. Can you come? This was, I was going to show the building, but it's so, uh, it was so ugly. It was depressing. And uh, we, we came and we started a, a group charrette uh, and, and, and developed it into this Umqua Bank, which became a really important client for us. And in this project, we took some of the early stuff that we developed in Schwab and were able to use it. Uh, there's always an embedded quality of, uh, of, of touch screens that you can do research on your own on their different products. But one of the really cool things about this is that there is a series of conference rooms, at least one or two in every bank, no matter how small they are, that are you can all you have to do is sign up. Anyone in the community can use them. When we did the flagship store in San Francisco, within three weeks, already three businesses have been formed using this these conference rooms. Here we did win an AIA award for this. Reno uh, AIA or Nevada AIA was very courteous and polite. polite. But there's also a regional quality and a climate quality here. The overhangs that protect uh, protect both the user and the building from the rain and the snow and during the winter, but also allow the radiant heat and light in the winter and protect the building itself from the sun. It's just very simple, everyday passive environmental uh, aspects of how to build. Uh, this, I think, is a, just a one, one other example, and I, but I like working in an infill in a neoclassical building. I think we're very polite with the way we deal with the cornices, the scale, the proportion, the cash machine, the ATM has a canopy, well lit, and, and pretty secure. And then I really like the way down in, oh, hey, where is it over here? Is it? We incorporated, uh, we did uh, dozens of stores for them. We, they were like another client for us. It was like working with Gap Inc. or William Sonoma or any other client. And we treated them the same way. We didn't, didn't have the budgets, but every project, we didn't think of it as a thrift store. We thought of it as a store. So when we did the cookware and the glassware and the homewares, we used the same, we, we actually appropriated the methodologies that we learned from people like uh, William Snowman pottery barn. The clothing was all done in ways that we learned from Banana Republic. And we created these really wonderful, uh, organized, easily shoppable, easily identified stores throughout San Mateo, San Francisco, and Marin County. But also we use this, and this is something that maybe we could bring back into a, a future academic thing, is that we use this for a studio at CCA, and it was the topic was environmental and social justice. So we worked directly with Goodwill headquarters people. We met at their conference room. We did a pro. We studied the place. We 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 analyzed the workflow, the flow of goods, the donations, how they're brought in, how they're sorted, how they go to the stores. We wrote a program. We did site selection, and we did a schematic design both for their headquarters and a store. And then some people did a third thing, like somebody, one per student did 
incorporated the Goodwill Grocery Store, which I thought was a brilliant idea. This is another pro bono case study that is really about collaboration and just some really interesting ideas that a friend of mine from Cambridge, Michael Ramage, called and said he wanted to do these. He had a friend from MIT, and they, she's had a vocal group that does ancient music, and they wanted to build these domes that were like bowls. And uh, I said, you mean with your thin shell masonry, Michael? And he said, yeah, yeah because I knew he did that. And I said, that's unreinforced masonry. And we're in the biggest seismic zone in the world. So if you can do those calcs, and he said, oh, well, uh, and I said, we better get a local engineer. And uh, it was funny. I said, I'll call some people. I was going to call, well, some people, you know, and uh, about 20 minutes later, he calls and says, I found a guy on the internet who's expertise is base isolation and doing pro bono work for Burning Man. And he said he had loved to do this for us. And so Mark Sinclair and Michael were our engineers. We built this whole thing. David Meckel and my buddy from CCA, uh, his son, Adam, who was a structural engineer. This was in the recession, so we didn't have a big studio, but Adam was our one summer student. And he did all the drawings and like, structural, architectural, et cetera and worked on building this. So it was one of our most successful studios in some ways. Uh, it's an example of how the base isolation works. So as the force hits it, it rolls. As the force comes back, it comes back. But we had no time. I actually found the art, uh, what you call it, the contractor, and they were just wonderful. Uh, it, was, it was really fun. But so, how did we get it permitted? We convinced the city that we would do dynamic testing. And by that, we meant that we would move the whole base, the distance that it would be displaced if a, a certain magnitude earthquake hit it, and then we'd let it go. And it was this simple. If it collapsed, we would never let anyone in it. If it didn't, that they could go ahead and the charming host this is the musical group was going to do a series of presentations of music throughout the summer or this that's what it was housed so the you see the guy over he's up here so he's waiting when he gets to that distance he says mark it's ready and mark yells release and they let go of the clutch of the winch, which wasn't powerful enough. So we had to have all this people pushing and everyone falls back, stumbling away, thinking, and I'm sitting with the head building official saying, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. And guess what happened? Uh, absolutely nothing. It was the most bizarre thing ever. You know, it's just, you couldn't even notice it coming back. But we did have sensors embedded. We won a structural award. Uh, Two papers were written, one on the base isolation for small art projects, and the other was uh, 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 dynamic testing as code conformance. And here's what it looks like in the context. And then you can see this gentleman here. They, they played, they, oh, wait, 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 real quickly. That, that is a link if you wanna know more about it. It's, I, I don't even really know if I understand the music was very, very ethereal, and uh, the concept was about magic. Do I, how am I doing on time, Mike? Let me check real quickly. Oh, okay, we're okay. This is another case study. This was a, 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 a pro bono project for the oldest cooperative nursery school in, in San Francisco. We did everything from beginning to end. Uh, it was a wonderful collaborative process with the school, with all the community people, other people volunteered, some other architects helped, with, helped us with design and drawing. Uh, project management was all done pro bono by parents. And one of the fun things about this is one day, Steve at the office got a call and he said, hey, can you come talk to this guy? And this guy had walked out of the ocean. This is right on, ocean, on, on the Great Highway and the ocean's over here. And this guy walked out of the ocean with a surfboard and said, hey, can I paint some whale murals there? I do painting murals for save the whale. And so we also believe that the school should be, this place was so filled with light that they didn't ever turn the lights on until they got a new director. And then she insisted they turned the lights on. So our mistake, 
was not putting an override switch in. Because if we would have, they wouldn't have ever used that electricity, except at night. Has photovoltaics on the roof, so I wish we would have looked at the uh, utility bills, but I'm pretty sure it's uh, uh, below that zero uh, energy consumption. And it was just a lot of fun, and the kids are just beautiful. Talk a bit about Summer Studio. Uh, we did that, what we talked about, how it started. The next year, we did a survey of all the historical cultural resources in the central waterfront. We call it the obvious and obscure. The next year, we did a movie, which was shown in Florence and won an award. Uh, and the students from Cornell who had made the film were there and could see it. So that was all pretty nice. The third year, we did this anti-planning where their idea was to freeze the base level and then build a city of the future above it. This is an example of our rooftop exploration. Uh, one of the other things that was really fun we did one year was a, a study of the open space within a, in a block in San Francisco in a residential district. And that was really well attended. I mean, all sorts of, these are, we have these big, really nice uh, uh, lunch and the students would all explain their project and we would get people, this was published in the newspaper uh, and uh, all, all people from Cal and Stanford and Berkeley and all our buddies uh, from architects would come and stuff. So this one was about studying the rooftops of San Francisco. They also made a film. We had a really active blog during the whole part of this and it was very participatory. But what, what we really said is concerning the landscape of rooftops, we thought that restoring an identity to this vast resource was the first step toward reclaiming its topography and forging a sustainable urban geography. We hope our exploration of the groundless site would lead, would be, would serve as a catalyst for future uh, development and, and, and uh, advocacy. Uh, it did for us. I mean, I don't think we're the ones who invented like the idea of doing rooftops. It's pretty much a, a given at this point, but it was a lot of fun. And they did a deck of cards that had four sweet suits, four suits. This is their interventions. This one would be what if you did, or no, this is the what if. Uh, it was a lot of fun. This was really a robust way to work. This is kind of the, the end of the line, the end of the, let me check again, the end of the, uh, the firm to a large degree. This was a client bills. It, would, it had been uh, a little coffee shop. It started as a grocery store. Uh, it went, became a coffee shop. And we, we did a whole series of these throughout California, not, not as robust as Starbucks or something, but we did a, a couple dozen. And our goal, if our early goal was the raw and the cook, this is maybe the raw and the reused. Uh, it, we, our, we were really conscious about trying to put almost nothing into the store. Uh, and I, I, I think it was very successful. Here's an example. Uh, actually, what I like about this is you can see the, the, the column, the big, beautiful steel beam, the bar joists, the roof deck. So it's, a, it's an explanation. It's a diagram of primary, secondary, and tertiary structure. Uh, it's all reused wood. And uh, just a very simple building, uh, health department style backsplash out of stainless steel uh, that the kitchen consultant can do really easily. And then Personally, I love working with engineers that are willing to, 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 to deal with uh, composition and placement of ducts and things. And I think this exposed duct is actually much more beautiful than anything on the Centre Pompidou. This is a corporate headquarters store. We did the store. We did the upstairs is their corporate headquarters. If, and it's really just a place for people. There's probably at least four to six San Francisco police sitting outside drinking coffee. But what makes this kind of cool too is it's in Dog Patch, which is part of the central waterfront, which is where we had those three studios. But also two blocks from here is another pro bono project we did for the uh, Museum of Craft and Design. We've done three different uh, studies and schematic designs for locations near the museum on Third Street. And they, they were always too expensive. So I said, come on, we're going for a drive. And we, we're going to Dog Patch. We're going to go find this space. And we went to Third Street. And 
Uh, she, the woman who runs this thing, just said, oh my God, why weren't we here earlier? And it's turned out to be really beautiful little, uh, the entry is a roll down gray gate that has the name on it. And then it rolls up and then there's storefronts behind it. So it's sort of a play on uh, both security and an art piece. This, do I, let's see, do I have time or are you gonna, is this a hard stop? Am I, uh, now I got two more minutes. So this is our, our last, one of one of my last projects. It's for Nike Jumpman downtown LA in the theater district. Uh, it's just a store, but uh, for sneaker heads, that, that's the Jordan collection, it's kind of nice. But for code conformance heads, that's a two hour shopping mall. So always looking for ways that you can deal with different types of things and overlap. It's also the monumental stair to the upstairs brand identity. That's where I guess the Carmelo Anthony goes when you know he hangs out here. That we cut out the floor so that we could get more GLA so we could do the rooftop. Uh, it's pattern, patterned after those inner city tracks above a um, uh, above a gym. Uh, I don't know if any of you have played in them. I played that was where I played basketball in New York when I worked there. And then a glass rooftop basketball court, which was so much fun to stay away from and make sure someone else was responsible for it. No, but our structural engineer actually did all the testing for this. And the guy said uh, that at the city, well, I want to make sure if Shaquille O'Neal goes up to dunk and he falls, that it doesn't break. So someone said, how much does Shaquille O'Neal weigh? And that's how they tested it. They said from six feet, we would drop Shaquille O'Neal. And if it broke, then we'd have to do something. It didn't break. But the Europeans who had designed this wouldn't get the ICC approvals in the city, uh, in, the, in the states. Just, uh, it's what it looks like. So one, uh, the upstairs there that you see in the foreground uh, now is a really, a, a really kind of cool testing area. The kinesiology department at USC runs a, a really robust testing uh, program for high school athletes and for elite athletes. So Michael and Michael's here. So Michael and I were at the uh, retreat, the faculty retreat. And he said, I told him about something I was doing where I had some images that I wanted on the other side. I didn't know what I would do. And he said, he'd always wanted to do a thing where you would look at a building and say, here's what it is, here's what it could be. And I was thinking about it. I said, Michael, I spent the last 40 years doing this. I didn't say that to him because it seemed a little snarky, but I can today. <laughs> and so here, here is what they consider full or lease, fully renovated. And then here's what we did. So what do you think, Mike? Not better than after. The after is better? Okay, all right, a little at least. And then, you know, this isn't go without like some ethical concerns. So this is definitely taking this wonderful street and, and improving it and for the community, but it's also probably the catalyst for further uh, gentrification. Uh, one thing I was very disappointed in, we couldn't talk them into doing a plaque on the back side that said this was a former footlocker store which was looted and burned to the ground or burned and the post uh, riots after the acquittal of the police in the Rodney King trial, or it's really not Rodney King, it's the police were on trial and something else of that sort. Uh, and I always thought maybe someone like Michael Jordan should do that. This is the last thing I'll talk about. This is a client that we love dearly. The, uh, we're, well, here, I can probably do it with the mouse. This is Glide Memorial, which is one of the greatest uh, Christian churches in the world. Serves the Tenderloin area of San Francisco a pro bono plan. We did a big, huge charrette for their master plan. We looked at three different buildings and did surveys for single room occupancy for potential housing projects. But the last thing we did was work on their food program. And everyone, not everyone, but a lot of people in the office actually did volunteer work at it. And our concept, it was very important that we looked at this not as a food give out soup kitchen style thing, but we used the same techniques and strategies, techniques and tactics and strategies that we used when we did the Wolfgang Park catering with EDG at the Union Station in Dallas. 
So we moved the eating upstairs near the windows and the ground floor is the banquet facility. The basement is a catering kitchen. And the one of the guys on the board uh, was uh, involved in a very successful restaurant chain. His kitchen consultant did all the work. We got Swinerton to do the cost estimates and us and our uh, uh, structural and mechanical engineers did this thing. And, and I don't know if they built it or how they where they stand at this point. But this and the sheriff's rehabilitation, women's sheriff's women's rehabilitation thing, which we did pro bono, which provided uh, classrooms and clothing store and cosmetics and makeovers and ways that they could take people, women who were released from the county jail uh, to, to try to rehabilitate their lives. Uh, one thing I wanted to conclude that looking to the future, I think we as architects, landscape architects, interior designers and planners should explore more cooperative and participatory, participatory office and work structures. But, but perhaps we should first understand that how we practice is, a, is at least as important as, as what we practice. Thank you.